edition of a delicious mess. We're here at Angie's Cafe in Newport News with Chef Pete. And we're going to make a delicious strawberry focaccia bread. With caramelized balsamic shells. Fresh ingredients. Local. That you can make for yourself at home. Thanks for joining us today. Hi folks. Uh, as you know, we're going to make a strawberry focaccia bread with caramelized balsamic shallot. One of the first things you're going to do is call your beans and floss, get some stuff together. Uh, right here, what I have is I got some all-purpose flour. What is all-purpose flour? It's something, uh, you look at it, the protein in it is going to be about 9 to 11 percent. If you bake a lot of cakes, cake flour you're going to use is going to have less than 9 percent. If you bake a lot of breads, you're going to want to get something with a higher uh, uh, protein content, maybe something around 10 to 12 percent. For this recipe and with most recipes and most home uh, cooks and chefs, just the regular all-purpose flour will work. What I did here was when you get your when you get your flour home from the store, it comes in a bag. The bag can be permeable and it can pick up off flavors and off odors and whatnot. So when you get it home, just open it up, get yourself your hand in a little sifter and just dump it in and just keep sifting it until it goes out way in there and you fill up the whole, the whole bucket. Get a plastic that uh, is not going to go ahead and pick up any odors or whatnot. Why do you want to sift it? First thing first, it's going to break up any clumps of flour. Uh, second thing is, you got any bugs and critters running around here, you're going to get it up. What you're going to need today for this recipe is about two and a half cups of all purpose flour. Why do I say that? Two, about two and a half cups. Start with two and a half, and depending on the humidity level, if you're here in Hampton Roads like we are, uh, humidity levels may affect that. It might be more, it might be less. You're also going to need about a quarter of a cup of uh, olive oil. For this one, I'm using uh, exactly that. You're going to need one cup of flour. We're using lager today because we're cheating the recipe. We're going to cheat the recipe. We're going to make it happen a lot quicker than an overnight dress, and we're going to get the same flavor out of the dough. When you hear lager, think of the word longer. When it's brewed, it's brewed at a colder temperature, and it's going to give it a robust flavor to any dough that is put into it. If you can't have alcohol, that's fine. Just use water instead. An option to this is if you take the lager out and replace it with a cup of water, instead of using a whole packet, Yeast, only use a half a pack of yeast. Put it in there and stick it in the fridge overnight. It's going to ferment and you're going to get the same robust flavor out of that. You're also going to need a teaspoon of salt, a teaspoon and a half of sugar. First thing we're going to do is, for this you will need a stand mixer. I know I have a paddle mixer on here right now and at some point you will use an actual bell hook. The paddle mixer is going to work so you can actually go ahead and build it into a slurry first. We're going to get about half the flour in there. We're going to let it sit with the yeast for a few minutes, probably five to ten minutes, so the yeast starts to bloom. A lot of recipes will tell you to bloom this in a glass, uh, about a quarter cup of water and some sugar. With instant yeast, you really don't have to do that. The big thing you want to do is if you're going to bloom it in a bowl like, like this right now, don't put the salt in right now. It might kill all the yeast. The other thing we're going to do today as we go through this video is I'm going to show you how to try to use maybe the same bowl multiple times for multiple things without burning stuff. My first job in the restaurant industry, I was 12 years old and I was washing dishes. My second job, I was about 14 years old in the restaurant industry, I was washing dishes. I don't like washing dishes. So today as we cook, we're gonna wash as little dishes as we can, maybe do it in one pan, one bowl, and we're also gonna work with a little bit counter space. All right, folks, uh, remember earlier I said, take your flour, sift it, put it in a bucket, put the lid on it, make sure you put what brand of flour it is on there uh, and what the date is as well too. This way if the store ever has a big call, you know whether or not you got to throw it out. When you're, when you're going to measure with a dry scoop, uh, this is for dry. This is for wet ingredients. So for dry, like flour, you do what's called a scoop, a swipe, and a dump. So real quick, I scooped it, take something like a spatula, I swiped it, and I dump it. So that's one cup, we're doing a cup and a half. So again, scoop it, swipe it, dump it. We're going to need more of that in a minute, so I'm just putting it right here. Right now, I'm taking my teaspoon and a half of sugar, putting it in there, taking a whole packet of uh, instant yeast, putting that in there. Take your spatula, you can just give it a little bit of stir around if you want. Dump about an eighth of a cup of your oil in there right now. Just to get it started. I've already measured this, so I know how much oil I got in there, so that's actually a quarter of a cup. And you're going to want to put your 
a cup of lager or water in there. It's a 12 ounce bottle. So I don't want to get too about here. I know I've got about a cup. I can always add more of this later to adjust it. I know what you're saying, but wait a minute, you're telling me a cup of this, a cup of that, and whatnot. It'll work out. Because as you as you see, if it's going to be looser or thicker, you can either add liquid or you can add a little bit of flour without affecting it. So now take it and put it in. And we're getting started. We're forming a slurry right now. And it brings the camera over. You see what's going on now. If you notice, I didn't turn this on high because if I did, the flour would go everywhere. So what we're going to do is we're just getting the yeast to get started with the sugar. If you notice, I didn't put the salt in right now. If I put the salt in, it's going to kill the yeast on our, and then your dough won't work. It won't rise up. So once we get it looking like a paste, we're going to let it go for about a minute. So I got it looking like a paste. And now I'm just going to go ahead. Let that sit for about 10 minutes so that yeast could actually grow five to 10 minutes. I'll be able to come over and smell it later and see what it looks like. For the next step, is when I'll go ahead and I will actually put the dough hook on. So we're going to wait 10 minutes and we'll be right back to see it. All right, folks, 10 minutes has passed and we're getting ready to go ahead and add the rest of the flour to the slurry. Right now, it kind of looks like a little bit of glue or paste in there. So, again, yeah, we're going to scoop. I'm going to swipe it. That's a half cup. We're going to put a total of one more cup of flour in the mixer. We're going to turn it on. The dough hook is on now. Lock your mixer in place. Can you make this by hand? Absolutely. You can make it by hand. It's going to take you a little bit longer. Uh, you're going to be rolling it out. You're going to get big muscles on it. But a hand mixer isn't going to work with this. I know some of them have a dough hook on it, but really, if you don't have a stand mixer, Consider having someone invest in it for you so that way you're not buying it, someone else is. So if you notice, I kind of got it on a, a low speed right now. The dough is starting to, uh, flour starts incorporating through the dough. It's getting a little bit thicker now. Once it starts to come together, I have to take the speed up a little bit. And as you see, it's starting to incorporate all that flour in there. It's really not sticking to the bottom. Now, at this point, you can keep it on the speed if you can build one up one. This is about halfway up uh, on the speed. Speed knob of the mixer. If you notice, it is start kind of shaking it around. That's because the dough is in there. You can uh, swiggle it around the inside of this, and it's just causing the vibrations. It's nothing to worry about. The important thing with your dough that some people make a mistake. The first was if you put the salt in too early. Now's the time to put the salt. Had we put the salt in earlier, it would have been able to kill the yeast, and we wouldn't be able to stay right now. Why? Because if the yeast is dead, you're not going to get that, that, that expansion of gas that raises your dough up and makes the area well. The other thing, too, is when I put this in right now, it's really important to have a develop those gluten things that are in there. So, again, this is a bread flour, excuse me, this is an all purpose flour. So, we've got about 11% gluten in there. If you don't have to beat the dough for about 10 minutes, you're not going to form those gluten strands. If you talk to a, a, a baker uh, or a pastry chef, they'll actually take the temperature off. Frankly, we're in our houses, we're in our apartments, we're just going to go ahead and do this for about 10 minutes. That's going to beat it long enough, it's going to get that salt in there now, and you're going to form those gluten strands. So, when you let it rest, it's going to go ahead and it's going to double up in size. So, let this go for about 10 minutes, and we'll come back and we'll finish it. Uh, looking down and the dough is sticking to the bottom. That's because it's a humid day that's sitting around here and there's a lot of moisture getting into this flour. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with about an eighth of a cup. And for this, we're just going to eyeball it. Or actually, I'm going with a quarter of a cup. That's a half cup, one half cup. Put it in. Lock it back in place. Now, being you got the flour in there, you got that blob of dough sitting there, just start it on slow until it works in. If after about four or five minutes of running, it looks like that again, and add about a tablespoon of flour until you get a consistency that pulls away from the side. We'll be back in a few seconds to show you exactly what this looks like. While we're mixing, yeah. would you like to tell us some of the things that you sell at the farmer's market? Yes, uh, I do. Uh, I got a business on the side called PTT Sweets, uh, mainly deals with um, a lot of hot sauces, hot jellies, uh, so forth, that I grow the hot peppers myself. I do a ghost pepper jelly that I call a Chernobyl jelly. Uh, I do a 
habanero mint jelly I sell there. There's various hot sauces, everything from habanero hot sauce to homemade goat pepper hot sauce, Carolina Reaper hot sauce. Anything I can work the hot pepper into, I, I try to. Uh, holiday seasons, I often do some uh, other baked goods, uh, some recipes that my family. For a long time, I'll sell those there. I also do hot chocolates uh, during the holidays, where I, uh, this past year I had um, it was a fine chocolate, hot chocolate mix that had ghost pepper in it. Uh, that seemed to sell really well. I also had uh, some hard shell chocolate truffles that had hot deal long pepper in it. One of the things I do get repeat customers come back for in the fall is seasonal. Everything I sell, you can find it here at the Southern Farmers Market right now, Halloween ish, we're taking it all depends on the nature of what's been grown in my yard, what I'm able to process stuff into. I do a uh, spicy kosher dill pickle. It's got aki limon pepper in it. It's got a Thai sweet hot pepper in it. It's got gherkin pickles uh, that I grow myself. It's got the dill I grow myself. It's got the garlic that I grow myself. Uh, that is my number one seller that is there. Another thing I do, uh, sells out pretty well, is uh, my sriracha sauces. I do a green apple and red bean sriracha sauce. The uh, way my business came about was I uh, went to chef school, uh, graduated locally from community college around here. Worked the industry for a little bit, uh, injured myself, couldn't do 14, 15 hour days on my feet, so I went back to a uh, job at Ace and Half. Worked there full time now, and on the side, I still do private chef stuff, and I also got a little gig at the Southern Farmers Market. Sitting around, you know, I'd be sitting there on Friday, Saturday night, watching television, doing whatever, eating food, putting the store bought hot sauce on my food because I love hot pepper stuff. And I noticed that the stuff in the store just wasn't cut for me. So I started to play around with like, hey, dude, I went to chef school. Why don't I just make some of these items myself? So one of the first things I made was the green apple and red bean sriracha sauce. It also had the, uh, it's got nine different peppers in it. Uh, two of the hottest peppers in the world is going to have the ghost pepper and Carolina Reaper. It goes really good on pizza. It goes really good on chicken nuggets. Uh, that recipe right there itself took me nine years to develop to what we have right here today. So I've just been in working that long. I just started selling them in the Southern Farmers Market in the fall of 2020. Alright All right, folks, and I got to turn it up a little here. We're building that gluten strand in there that you see. And if you can hear every now and then a slap on the side of the bowl. When you're doing that, crank the speed up to about a medium high and let it off about another minute, which is what we've been doing right now. After that, I'm going to take it out, form it into a ball. I'm going to put it back in that bowl and let it go ahead and rise for about an hour. So, real quick, what we do is I shut it off, take the dough hook off. You remember earlier I said my first and second job in the restaurant industry was working um, working as a dishwasher. And also in here, if you noticed, we don't have much kitchen counter space, so maybe you got a small kitchen. Maybe you just live in an apartment, take the bowl, form it into a ball like you see, put it in there. At this point, you got two options. You could wrap it with plastic wrap, put it in the freezer, or excuse me, put it in the fridge for about overnight, no more than overnight. Or if we're gonna bake this like we are within the next hour, we just take it, cover it with a clean dish towel, and let it sit there. And once it's doubled in size roughly, then we'll go ahead and we'll put it in the pan. All right, folks, a little safety tip at home. When using a, any kind of a spray oil, don't do it over the floor, because if that gets on the floor, you're gonna end up slipping on it. If you got something hot in your hand, it's not gonna be nice, it's gonna end up on your burning. Take it, go over your sink. This way, anything that you're spraying goes into the sink, you can wash it up later. That's one of your safety tips for today. Thank you. Okay, folks, while your dough is resting for about an hour, what you wanna do is you're gonna wanna go do the rest of your measles class for the toppings. So for the topping for this, we're going to have some fresh rosemary, uh, we're going to have some shallots, and we're also going to have some Parmigiano-Reggiano cheese. When you get your cutting board, if you ever notice you try to put on something that moves around a lot, instead of going and spending a lot of money on non-skewed items, just get yourself a paper towel, wet it, wring it out, put it down, and like daddy magic, it doesn't go anywhere. Shallots. For this recipe, you're going to need about two and a half cups of shallots. And what I mean by two and a half cups is... They're gonna cook down. So you're gonna fill this up probably about all the way. This is a two cup measure, if it's up to the top, that's fine. The nice thing about when you cook the shallot and caramelize it, you can keep it in the fridge. Once it's cold, keep it in the fridge for about a week. So you can make this part of the dish a week in advance and then add the topping to it later. When you get your shallot, you might be able to buy them individually. Or you might be able to buy them in a bag. This is a knife guard. I suggest you buy one. Keeps your fingers in your hands. One of the things friends always tell me is they say, man, those shallots, 
got to be something really hard to peel. When you hear of a shallot, I like to use them a lot more than a red onion or a standard onion or just garlic alone by itself. Something I like to tell the people about, uh, about shallots is, imagine if a clove of garlic and a red onion were really good friends and were sitting around one night watching movies, things got right, we got the talk, and nine months later, a shallot would be born. Because it's about what it tastes like in both of them. Now the part's gonna come to peel them because this, this wrapper around here is about as tough sometimes as your printer paper. Easy way to do that, get yourself a jar, keep them around the house, here's an old candy jar filled with water, you're gonna need a lid for it. Fill it up, do this next step next to the sink. Put the shallot in there, you can see the water's leaking out. Just take it, cover it up. 15, 20 minutes later, that's gonna soften it up enough, we're gonna go ahead and peel it. We'll do that with all the shallots. If you don't have a jar to put it in, something else you can do is get yourself a zip bag. Put your shallots in the zip bag. Fill it with water, squeeze the air out, let it sit in the sink. Why do you want to let it sit in the sink or another container? Well, because zip bags have a tendency of breaking. And breaking. So once it's done, we'll peel them and then we'll, we'll slice them up. Okay, folks, next ingredient you're going to want is going to be rosemary. If you've got a green thumb, grow it in your backyard. If you've got a neighbor, grow it off of them too, borrow it from them. If it comes in a plastic container, that's fine. Buy it in the store, you can find lots of that. That's something I do want to show you here. If something happens after a couple of days, and that is your fresh one compared to a few days old. Believe it or not, this one still has a little bit of life left in it if you want it to. First thing you're going to do is take and just give it a couple smacks, see what falls off. That one right there. This one right here is actually a little bit better. Just take one, you can take the back of a spoon, the back of a knife, and all you're trying to do is break anything loose off it. Why? Because anything that's loose, like that one, uh, that's stuff that's pretty much on its last leg. So you're going to get that off. Once you get all them off, take them, and you can go ahead and process them. Now, when it comes home from the store, one thing I do want to point out is this is a green herb. And for this recipe, you don't want to use, uh, you don't want to use dried uh, rosemary. If you use dried rosemary, it's going to be able to pull toothpicks poking them out. So you're going to want fresh. So first thing you're going to do when you get it is you're going to examine it. You're going to make sure there's no mold or mildew growing on it. And most importantly, you're going to make sure there's no bugs growing on it. This grows uh, in people's backyards. It grows in uh, hot houses and so forth. So you're going to make sure there's none of that on there. The other thing you're going to do when you get it home is do what the, uh, the health department says. And it's simply... You don't need to go out, you don't need to buy vegetable wash and waste your money on it, just wash it under uh, some, some water. So you're just going to take them, give them a good rinse, you're going to shake them off, and you can either process it and use it, or if you want, you can let it dry, and if it dries, let me get some dry blend real quick. If I want to make this last longer, along with other green leafy vegetables, follow or, uh, green leafy herbs, is go ahead, wash them, dry them, then when you get done, take them, put them in a paper towel once they're dried off, roll it up, write what it is on a zip bag, put them in a zip bag, put it in the fridge, make sure you put the date on it and keep an eye on it. So they'll last, you'll probably double the life of your, your green leafy herb if you follow that little trick right there. When you go to pull these out, if there's any bigger branches coming out, so snap the bigger branches off first and then pull the needles off. If you notice I'm holding it, it's leaning over to one side. Grab it right about where it was leaning. Take your thumb and forefinger and just bring it on down. When you run it on down, you'll get all those needles off. Carefully work your way up the stem. At some point, and if I pull hard enough, it'll break right there. That's fine. Just take it, throw it all in there. There's not much you can use this for at this point, except maybe putting in your compost pile. Um, again, the bottom ones here, they look a little rough, so I'm just going to take those off and not toss them. And again, for this recipe, we're going to need about a tablespoon, tablespoon and a half of uh, rosemary. Cut. Or chopped. So we're going to start with about that much. 
at this point, make sure you got a decent sized board, a knife that feels good in your hand. Day one in chef class, you know what the number one safety rule I learned? And this is your safety rule of the day number two here. A falling knife has no handle. I'll say it again, a falling knife has no handle. Most chefs keep their knives uh, razor sharp. I say most. Uh, I do. If this thing falls, I'm not going to try and catch it. You can cut a finger off with that. Maybe when the knife falls, not if it, when it falls. Just move your feet out of the way so you don't stab your feet. So remember, falling knife has no handle. Now I'm just going to take it. Easiest way to go ahead and bust this down is just put it in a pile. And I'm going to use a rocking motion. I'm just going to work myself from left to right, just back and forth. And if you can see some of this moving around, flying off as I cut into it, that's fine. And we're just going to keep working through it if you can see it. Here's the pile, spreads out. Go ahead, bring it back up, run on through it again. Once it gets into something about that size, if you don't have these at the house, a small ramekin will work, or you can just leave it on the board until you need it. Uh, whatever makes your little heart happy, right? Just take it and put it in your container. At the house, my daughter would break out a funnel right now. If you want to do that, that's fine. But remember, my first job in the restaurant industry was washing dishes. If I don't have to wash it, I don't want to wash it. So we got that done, and the next we're going to move on to is the Parmigiano Reggiano cheese. Parmigiano Reggiano cheese. If you're like me, like most Americans, we grew up with that green can that sits on the store shelf and it's shelf stable. And frankly, most chefs are going to tell you when it comes to cheese, they're not a fan of the can, and I'm definitely one of them for uh, several reasons. First is flavor, it really doesn't have any flavor. If you could get a sheep's milk parmesan, or in this case it's a parmesan reggiano, it's something that's aged, it's gonna be harder. It's gonna have a lot more flavor. What I like to do is I like to grate it, put it in a glass jar, uh, put a date on it. It'll keep fresh in there for about two weeks without losing any flavor. You don't have to grate it all at once. Whatever you don't grate, go ahead, wrap it up in a little bit of um, wax paper, stick it in a Ziploc, and again, write the date on it, put it back in your cheese crisper. To grate it, you could use one or two sides of your, your regular box grater. You can use uh, that side, uh, or you can use that side, whichever you use smaller for that. What I like to do when I grate it is on my cutting board, I'll put down a dish towel. I'll put down some wax paper, and I'll take it and I'll actually grate it. After I grate it again, remember, I don't like washing dishes if I don't have to. Once you grate it, you can just take it. Carefully, just go ahead and put it into your jar. This is something I grated uh, day before yesterday. It smells really good. Uh, it's going to have a lot more flavor, a lot more robustness. Uh, definitely, definitely an added uh, addition to your dish. Another reason uh, I don't like to use pre-grated cheese or pre-shredded cheese in a bag is the anti-caking agents that they have. There's nothing wrong with the anti-caking agents. They're perfectly safe for you to consume. However, there's two things. First is going to be it doesn't melt the same as a regular block cheese. So even if you got, say, cheddar cheese, buy your cheese in, in, in bulk in your 8 or 8 or 16 ounce block, shred it like I just showed you, put it in a Ziploc bag, put the date on it, put it in the fridge, Parmigiano Reggiano, you saw what I just did with this. The third reason I don't like to use the pre-grated cheese fan of a can or a fan of a bag or whatever you call it, Go ahead and look at the label. If I look at this label and I read you the ingredients, it's going to have three in it. Milk, salt, and rennet. That's it. If you look at something that's pre-graded, one of the last ingredients you'll see on here is going to be something called cellulose, which is perfectly edible, folks, and it's wood fiber in a nutshell. Now, no, they're not going out, they're not cutting down a tree, or not feeding it through a big chipper and putting it into your cheese products or anything like that. It does occur on certain vegetables and whatnot, uh, and it's processed to add as an anti-caking agent. Two of the most common places you're really going to find uh, cellulose in its natural form are collard greens. If you look, you got the leafy part running down the side, that thick part down the middle. That is really high in cellulose. The other place you're going to find it is you take some garbanzo beans in a can, and you drain a can, and you squash the bean between, say, a butter knife or something like that, and outer skin comes off. That's all cellulose. And again, it's wood fiber. Now, why am I telling you about this? Because if you eat it and you get some, you know, little discomfort in your abdomen or in your gut or your pants don't fit right, one of the side effects of cellulose is it doesn't break down well in your intestinal tract. 
So if you get any kind of health issues like that, go with the fresh stuff. Uh, again, Mediterranean diet, when you look at this, Mediterranean diet doesn't have cellulose in it. Uh, go ahead and use it. So those are the three reasons I'm not a fan of the can. So it's been about 15, 20 minutes. We're taking the shallot out of the water. Clean that up later. So here it goes, peeling. Here's how I like to do it. I take the top off and I take the bottom. And I know what you're thinking. You're going, oh, wow, that's a lot of waste. I'll show you here in a second. This is a double one. What we'll do is carefully. Back. One separated. If you get a double lobe like that, don't go freaking out. You can see how this one's single compared to this one was a double. Nothing wrong with it. Save the skins on this, save the skins on your onions. Um, as you get all your vegetables, uh, bottom and celery, you could with carrots do this. I don't like to because carrots are kind of sweet, so those actually go in a compost pile. Take a bag, write the date on it. Take your scraps from your vegetables. So celery, onions, shallots, um, parsley, green leafy herb, rosemary. Take it, seal it up, throw it in your freezer, and at a later time, I'll show you how to make a vegetable stock out of this that you can use for when you're boiling your rice, or you can make a vegetable soup out of it. There's a lot of soups and stews that you can make. Instead of throwing it out, you can actually flavor your water with this, and then you've got your vegetables. So, now what we're going to do is, as we cut this, we're just going to cut it into about quarter inch rings. What does quarter inch ring look like? Uh, if anybody in your uh, family has a number two lead pencil, it's about, uh, about the same width as the diameter of a number two lead pencil. So, we're just going to break these down. And the reason we want this. Is next step is going to be we're going to go ahead and remember the dough. We've got about an hour, hour and a half till the dough doubles in size. Uh, so we're just going to go ahead and we're going to get our mise en place in place while everything's going. Once I get to this point, I just take them and break them down. Take them into rings. If it looks like that, that's fine. I like them separately as much as I can for the bigger rings because that way it cooks up easier uh, in the saute pan. Now, like I said, you can make this in advance. Heck, you can. You could buy these by the pound if you want. You make a pound of these at once, stick it in the fridge. Can you use it on something else? Uh, I was just recently asked. The answer is yeah. Put them on top of your burgers. Put a little cheese on there, put that on top of the burgers, and be fine. Shallots, I really like shallots more than I do a standard onion. Or, uh, it's the best of both worlds. Like I said, it's a little bit of a red onion, a little bit of garlic, uh, all in one. So, we'll bust these apart. And then on the next step, we'll get the pan out. We'll get the induction range out and we will go ahead and finish the recipe up for you. Folks, well, next up is you're going to want to get yourself, um, I like to use a nonstick pan for this one. Anything from about six to eight inches in diameter from the opening is going to be fine. Make sure it's got a good heat element on the bottom. We're using an induction burner right now. So this cooks with magnets and that's why I can put my hand on here and it's not burning me. So once I put this on, it's going to start to cook. So you're going to go ahead and turn it on. Uh, start to get everything going on it. What I like to do is take your shallots. And in this order, put them in a the pan. About a tablespoon, one tablespoon and a half of olive oil. Put that in there. You're going to put about about the same amount of water. You put a lid on it. I know that's not a lid. This is a small pizza pan. When you buy these nonstick pans, they don't come with lids. And if you do come with a lid, they're going to fit inside. And it's actually going to wear the non-sticking off your pan, so don't use it. So what we're going to do is I call this a rule of six. So we're going to cook this for a total of six minutes and two minute increments. So right now we're going to go ahead and it's going to cook right now for just two minutes. After two minutes, take the lid off. I stir everything around or you can flip it. Get it stirring good. Continue cooking it. Lid back on another two minutes. At the end of two minutes, the end of two minutes, take the lid off, give it one last stir. And that water, what had happened was the water, when you look at the shallots or onions, so this, this technique will also work for an onion. Shallots are mainly water, just like an onion is. So by putting the water in here and creating steam, you're actually enveloping everything and cooking it a little bit quicker. So you're starting to break it down and get more contact in the bottom of the pan. So after a second, two minutes, now you got the lid off it, the water is going to be evaporating. 
And we're going to finish cooking it on down, and that's when the caramelization process starts, which you'll see here in a very short. All right, folks, right at the end, what you're going to do is you're going to go ahead, you're going to dump your balsamic vinegar in there. You're going to cook it down a little bit, and at this point, you can put a good pinch of sugar in there if you want, or some honey. I've already added some uh, local honey for this. And I'm just stirring it around, and I'm getting most of it to evaporate. I don't know if you can tell if you bring the camera over close, you can see when I get to look like it is right now, that's the level you want them. At this point, take them out, put them in a separate bowl, they're going to finish cooling down. Or you can just put this on a wire rack and let it finish cooling out itself. All right, folks, what we did is I went ahead and I realized, hey, I'm going to cook this in a couple days or whatever, and I just take them, put them in your favorite plastic container, write the date on it, park it in the fridge. I could keep this in the fridge, like I said, about five to seven days. So you don't need your strawberries unless you pick them yourself. You can also buy local in a store like this one is right now. It's going to come in a flat like this. When you get them home, uh, one of the things we learned going through chef school, uh, especially doing catering, uh, a lot of times you're in the kitchen by yourself and you do like 20 projects at once. Do one motion at a time. So when you get your strawberries on, you're going to have to prep them. So the first thing you want to do is you're going to want to take off the green stem. So just take off your green stems like that. Okay. Your next step. You're going to rinse them. After that, you got to pit them. I don't know about you, but I don't really like taking a knife this far in because I'll tell you what, there's been a lot of times, again, as a chef, a like knife has no handle. You poke yourself, you cut yourself. Look around your grocery stores or your bargain store nearby and see if you can find a little spoon uh, about that size. And it comes in real handy. But what you do is just take it and using your thumb as leverage, you're putting it in. Just making a rotation, and there you go, it's cord. Again, take it, turn it around, and it's cord. Last one, putting it in, thumb is leverage, pulling it towards me, and it's done. Next step is going to be to go ahead and dice these. I'm going to use about a quarter of an inch or eighth of an inch, and basically, I just I like to do something about an eighth. Depending on the size of the strawberry, you can see the size I'm breaking it down to. That's a little bit about the size of a penny. Now, after you get it all broke down, you're going to need about a cup. If you got more than a cup, don't worry. Later on, you could actually go ahead and spread a little sugar on these, and they're all nice and good to go. Just want to clean up. Why do I want to clean up? Because if you ever work with strawberries and cherries, you know that they stink. So I will come back and sanitize that later. What I'm going to do right now is uh, next stuff that's going to go on here. You're going to need some olive oil, your Parmesan cheese, your caramelized balsamic shallots, uh, and your rosemary. You're going to put that about yeah, about a tablespoon and a half ish. And Take a brush. Again, you can pick these up at a hardware store at about a buck, buck and a half a piece. You get a few uses out of them. Just make sure you wash it well. You're clean. Well, it's one pan I was using right here. Uh, it's going to be a 13 by 9 inch pan. That's what this kosh is on right now. In your house, you may have one of these other two, probably the top one, which sits around. If that's all you have, you can go ahead and use it. This is called a uh, quarter sheet pan. So if you go to your local restaurant store, you ask for a quarter sheet pan. The ones I have over here, this big one on the bottom, that's a half sheet pan. Like I said, odds are grandma or somebody in your family gave you one of these. If it's if it's a lot darker and all black, it's because they use butter uh, on it and the butter burns. That's why the pan is probably black. If this is all you have and you want to make this on it, that's fine. Just stretch it to about a 13 by 9. If you stretch it all the way to the corner on a bigger pan, you're going to have to reduce your cook time because you're going to have a thinner crust. Thinner crust means it's going to cook and burn quicker. So if you do stretch it out to the bigger pan, reduce your cook time. All right, folks, a little moment of magic here. It's been about a little over an hour, and you can see the gas bubbles have formed. Now, as I said earlier, we're working with a limited counter space. If you look at other recipes for this, they'll tell you to, to put it on a, dust a little flour on a countertop, roll it out in a rectangle uh, with a rolling pin, and go about your life. Again, I don't like washing dishes, so this is going to go from here right to that pan that I just uh, generously oiled with olive oil. So pull it out, you can see what it looks like. Kind of giving it a little push down, and I can formulate it kind of rectangular, best I can. And that's what I'm going to do. Now, watch. I 
purposely put down a little more oil than I need. Why? Because you want it on your kosher bread, you want to have two sides of oil. First on the bottom so it doesn't stick. Second on the top because that's where your yummy goodness is going to go. So you can see I'm pulling it over into the corner. It's nice and rested. If it doesn't fully match up, don't freak out. Don't worry about it. Take your rosemary. A sprinkle of rosemary. Add as much as you want. Add as little as you want. But if you don't like it, don't add it. Now the next part is plain with the food. <coughs> Take your fingertips and just go ahead and this is going to actually get that rosemary down into the dough. And I just like to get it. The other thing this is going to do when you poke all these little divots in here with your fingers, it's going to keep it from springing back. Now I know what you might be saying is, hey, I don't have gloves at my house. Okay, if you don't have gloves at your house, wash your hands really good, make sure you clean your fingernails, dry them off, and go ahead and press about it and you'll be fine. The cheese, remember we grated it earlier? If it gets clumped up in the bottom, just take it, give the jar a little bit of a wiggle, and it'll come right back to its springiness. So at this point, I just give it a dusting. How much is that? How much you want? That right there was about a good two tablespoons. Next, I'm taking the shallots. Again, how many shallots you want is entirely up to you. If you don't have a shallot, can you use a red onion? Absolutely. Keep in mind some of the other onions you use, um, they'll be a little lighter in color. Uh, also, depending on where they're grown, some of your onions are going to have a high sulfur content. So if you look at like a medallion or a Texas sweet, uh, there's not much sulfur in the soil where those are grown. So like a medallion or a Texas sweet, even a Walla Walla, you can eat that like an apple. Uh, there's not much uh, sulfur in it. Whereas if, you know, if I took seeds and went out from those onions that I just mentioned and I grow it up in, uh, say grow it up in Pennsylvania, up in coal mine country up there, a lot of sulfur in the ground. Well, all of a sudden, guess what? Sulfur, when you grow, goes into the actual item itself, and you end up with uh, an onion that now makes you cry, even though it's something like a, uh, a walla walla. Okay, so how many uh, shallots I got out there? Put your strawberries on. One of the things I like to do is I actually like to flip them over, just so the red pretty side is up. Uh, one thing I learned going through chef school is one of the one of the first times a customer is going to eat, or they're going to they're going to eat when they read the menu. Uh, they're going to eat with their eyes when it's uh, sitting with their customer next to them, or when it's coming out when the server's bringing it out to them. So they're putting the red side up, it's just a little more appealing. And again, you can put on as many as you want from the little bit. Why are we using a strawberry? Because we're in season where we're growing right now. So what you're going to have is you're going to have a sweet tanginess because of the shallots and so forth uh, and overall it's going to be really good uh, good flavor good feeling. So next the oven right here it's been preheating uh, 400 degrees preheating it for about 20 minutes so what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to park it in there. It's in the oven uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to let that go for about 15 minutes after 15 minutes, I'm going to open the door, I'm going to rotate it, and I'm going to drop the temperature down to 300. The reason I want to do that is I want to caramelize the outside of the bread, get a nice crust going on that. But at the same time, if I leave it at that 400 the whole time, outside of the bread, you're going to risk burning it. Whereas if I lower the temperature, it's going to finish cooking the bread while maintaining that brownness on the outside. All right, folks, it's uh, been about 20 minutes. We're going to throw out the temperature changes we're talking about. It's coming out of the oven now. Careful when you take it out. Super hot. And if you notice, I had to put this inside of a separate baking sheet. So what we're going to do, at home, if you got it from like a counter or, or anything like that, put a towel down first. It's going to protect it. So this is going to go on a wire rack right behind here in a second. So as you can see, there's our nice uh, nice toastedness. Uh, I, I wish we had smell of vision because uh, the folks behind the camera will tell you how good this smells. This is the hardest part right now. I'm putting it on the rack. I got to let that sit for about 10 to 15 minutes before I can take it out. If I try to take it out now, you're going to risk burning yourself. Also, the dough needs to do a little bit of firming up when it comes out by cooling off. If you try to take it out now, it's just going to fall apart. I use a fish spatula and an offset uh, icing spatula to get this out. 
And in a few minutes when it cools out, we'll take it out, we'll cut it, and we'll all enjoy some. We'll see what folks think about it. All right, folks, now, you pop up one side, get your wire rack. You got it out, it's been a couple minutes. Uh, we can go ahead and take it off there in a second. We'll finish cutting it. If you want to go ahead and take this to work or whatnot, let it sit in that wire rack for about an hour, hour and a half. It's going to finish uh, getting all the steam off of it. Because uh, if you wrap that up right now and you try uh, taking it to work tomorrow, you're going to have a big spongy blob. That's not, it's not something you can up. All right, folks, it's been a couple minutes. I'll pull it off. I'm going to get it down onto the cupboard. You can use your standard butcher's knife for this. I don't like to use a pizza cutter on this. Every time you use a pizza cutter, it just squishes everything off to the side. Uh, this is only about an 8 inch blade. If you got a 10, 12 inch blade, I got a 16 inch blade at the house, would have been better, but that's like a machete. I don't need people have machetes in the kitchen, but I do. Um, I like to go ahead, you can get 12 slices out of this, and we're just going to start with six right off the bat. It's always easier to move the food in your direction instead of you moving towards it, it's just a little bit safer. Just, these are still hot, so all I'm doing is breaking them apart a little bit, uh, let the, the steam get out. Because again, we spent all that effort and whatnot baking it. And if you go ahead and turn it into a giant sponge, it's going to taste, uh, it's going to have the texture of what it looked like before you put it in there. If some of your pieces fall off, that one, hey, you pay for it, right? Times are hard, money short, put it back on her. Alrighty. Now at this point, you can eat it like that. One of the things I do like to use uh, goes well with this, and this is an option. I've got the. This is some goat cheese. You can pick it up in the store. Goat cheese may or may not be expensive, depending where you have. Look for a manager special. Just make sure you know when the expiration date is going to be. I like goat cheese on mine. Uh, if you go into a restaurant, they'll have uh, it's called bruschetta, which is basically what we have here. Uh, some other ingredients you see on top are actually served on the side. If you don't like goat cheese, because goat cheese could be a little bit uh, grassy tasting, or if you're a hunter like me, some people say it's greeny tasting. It's not bad. Give it a shot. You're either going to like it or not. But if you don't like um, the goat cheese, go ahead and use something like cream cheese. Uh, you could also use mascarpone. Mascarpone is going to be a little, it's going to have a little tanginess to it, a little on the sweet side. It's all up to you what you want to use. So at this point, go ahead and I get some out. I like to just kind of put it up on top, right in the center. And who wants to try these? I'm like, oh, we've got a volunteer. Got a volunteer. <laughs> yeah. Ma'am, do you want to try some? Yes, sir. Okay. Asa, you want to try some? Right, Asa. Mr. Asa, come on over. You want an end piece or a middle piece? Mm -hmm. This is good. There you go, Asa. Hey, smile. Yeah. Nice to see you around. Can you have a bite? Here you go. Thank oh, you. Welcome, and of course, the chef will get some yeah. last. Really, really good. Parents and leaders, uh, we always eat last. Now, I got the olive oil. I got that, it's a little aromatic right there. I've got the rosemary. I'm not talking my mouth, it's good food. Mm. Tastes great. A glass of your favorite beverage at this point. The sweetness of the strawberries are really balanced well. You got the um, you got the balsamic vinaigrette in there with the shallots. These these all play well together in a plate. Ma'am, what do you think of it? Tell us what you think, to be honest. Delicious is the word. That is your So if you had to describe this in Spanish, how would you do it? Mmm, rico. Todos los ingredientes. Muy bueno. Juntos. Todos los ingredientes. Bien rico. Delicioso. Couldn't have said it better myself. 